Vicki, you must unmute. Oh yeah, I was un I was muted too. That's right. Good morning, and <clears throat> welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Catskills. Our minister is Reverend Bob Janice Dillon, who is on holiday for the summer. He will be back in the pulpit in September. Um, I'm Vicki O'Doherty, a member of the worship committee and the worship associate for this morning. I extend a big welcome to all of our Zoom attendees this morning. Unitarian Universalism is a liberal religious faith that carries no creed and welcomes all seekers. We are guided by a set of principles and written sources that encompass the many ways that we come to know and understand the world, the universe, and the divine. Our principles are important to us at UU Catskills and we live our values on a daily, daily basis. We affirm that Black Lives Matter. We are a welcoming congregation for the LGBTQ community. We are a congregational affiliate of the Ulster Defense, Immigrant Defense Network. And we are an active voice in the effort to address climate change. Community circles connect members with others that live in our local community. There are nine circles in different areas who meet monthly in person or online through Zoom. If you would like to get in touch with the circle in your area, please contact the office administrator. If you would like to contact someone at UUCC Catskills for those attending online, a contact list is shown on your screen. You can visit our website, uucatskills.org to find contact information. Also to be added to the mailing list and to find the latest newsletter. If you're a visitor online and you would like to be, con to be added to our mailing list, you can put your name and email address in the chat box area on Zoom. I remind you that during the service, you are encouraged to stay muted. We encourage you to read our newsletter that members and others on our, in our community and about, <laughs> that members and others on our in our community and also upcoming events for the month. Weekly updates are also sent by email and there you will find events for the coming week. So we have two, uh, oh, we have helping today. We've got Jenny Giddy O'Grady uh, as the Zoom host and Constance Rudd will be doing the offertory music. So we have two announcements for today. Uh, Reverend Bob will be conducting a UU session on Sunday, August 28th at 12 noon following the Sunday service. This one hour session will be oriented towards visitors and anyone considering membership in UU Catskills, but all are welcome. This will be held live at UU Catskill and also on Zoom. So check the weekly update for the Zoom link. We have another announcement too, which is the African American Cultural Festival in the Rondout will be held also on Sunday, August 28th from noon to 6 p.m. We are having a UU booth at this event and need volunteers to work in two hour shifts of two people. Please come and share the love as we share information about our congregation and give out free temporary tattoos, water and tri-colored sandwich cookies. To volunteer, please contact Donna Schlackman at donnaschlackman at gmail.com. Our prelude this morning is called, it, we have tenor, um, <laughs> Brandon Hornsby, Hornsby Selvin uh, with Adam Pot on piano and the music is Art Thou Troubled by George Frederick, Han Frederick Handel.
Join me in lighting the chalice um, with the chalice lighting words, which will be on your, which are on your screen. We light this chalice in grateful, loving community. Even in the darkest of times, may its flame light paths to courage, justice, and hope. <clears throat> and please join me in our unison affirmation. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts, gifts of love to all living beings. May we know once again that we are not isolated but connected in wonder and joy to mystery and miracle in the universe, in this community, and in each other. Our climate change quote today is by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. We don't have time to sit on our hands as our planet burns. For young people, climate change is bigger than election or re-election. It's life or death. Our opening words today are the way from called The Way Out, which was written by Kathy Fusan Hurt. In order to get out, I must go through. There is no other way. No other way? But there must be another way. An easier path, a well-lit road. I cast about 
scan the horizon, no other way. The way out is the way through. The way out is the way hard. He set behind and before a heavy hand laid upon me. Pass one trial, meet another, leap one hurdle, run against another. No turning back, no detours, no other way. Lord, how long? As long as it takes to get me there. Going down to go up, approaching heaven via hell. No other way. The only way out is through. Please join in singing hymn number 1008, When Our Heart Is in a Holy Place. Jenny, are we missing that music? Uh, yes, that sorry, that um, that didn't come through on your slides. So let's go on to not for children only. Certainly, we can do that. Okay. So the story of for not for children only today is called the beautiful tiger, and it's by Christopher Buse. There once was a beautiful and powerful tiger. One day she was captured by a mean and cruel man who put her into a cage. The man kept the cage in the jungle not far from his house. Every day he would bring out a bowl of water and some food for the lonely tiger. Sometimes the tiger would see her own reflection in the bowl of water and would say, my, I must be a beautiful tiger. When the man heard her say this, he would lie and tell her, no, you are not a beautiful tiger. You're very ugly. You're a pitiful creature. Sadly, the tiger would believe the man. Some days after she ate her food, she would walk back and forth in her small cage and feel energy and power moving through her body. And she would say, my, I must be a powerful tiger. When the man heard her say this, he would lie and tell her, no, you are weak and puny. You're a pitiful creature. Sadly, the tiger would believe the man. Then one day when the man was nowhere around, a lion happened to walk by the cage. The lion saw the tiger inside and spoke to her. Beautiful and powerful tiger, what are you doing lying about in that cage? Do not make fun of me, replied the tiger. I know that I am neither beautiful nor powerful. I'm not making fun of you, said the lion. You are surely the most beautiful and powerful tiger I have ever seen. I am only surprised to see you lying here when you are clearly strong enough to break out of that cage. You, you really think I could break out of here? Asked the tiger. Quite easily, I should think, replied the lion. Tiger was not so sure at first. She had been told so many times that she was weak and pitiful and a pitiful creature. But suddenly it seemed that she could feel energy and strength through moving through her body. She began to pace back and forth in her cage. And then almost without thought, she leaped against the cage door and it flew open without resistance. Once outside, she seemed dazed. That cage didn't even have a lock on it, she said. I spent so much of my life stuck in there and the door wasn't even locked. The lion looked at her with soft brown eyes and said, those kinds of traps don't need locks for it is the lies we believe in that keep us in our cages. And it is the truth that sets us free. And her story. <clears throat> Our meditation today and contemplation, who can be certain, the words are, who can be certain where the self stops and the universe begins? When we breathe, it is the air from the passing wind that fills our lungs. To our, nost to our nostrils drifts its fragrance of the wood fl woodland flower. When we taste, it is of the earth's flavors and saltiness. When we eat, it is of the field's corn 
and its wheat. When we open our eyes, they are filled with sunlight and starlight. Who can be certain where the self stops and the universe begins? Please take a few moments of silence to rest. Half plate donations for August 2022 will go to the Center for Creative Education, which is a nonprofit community center for arts, technology, wellness, and cultural education. As you can see on your screen, you have ways of donating. Um, half plate, so you can donate through our website or you can send a check to UU Catskills. For our overdrive music today, we have Constance Rudd singing a song that's by Mary Gaucher. Um, all you, Constance. Yes. My father could use a little mercy now. The fruits of his labor fall and rot slowly on the ground. His work is almost over. It won't be long and he won't be around. I love my father. We we could use some mercy now. My brother could use a little mercy now. He's a stranger to freedom, shackled to his fears and his doubts. The pain that he lives in is almost more than living will allow. I love my brother, he could use some mercy now. church and my country could use a little mercy now as they sink into a poison pit that'll take forever to climb out they carry the weight of the faithful who follow them down I love of my church and country, they could use some mercy now. Every living thing 
could use a little mercy now only the hand of grace can end the race towards another mushroom cloud people in power they'll do anything to keep their crown i love life and life itself could you some We all could use a little mercy now. We maybe don't deserve it, but we need it anyhow. We hang in the balance, dangling between the hell and hallowed ground. Yes, every single one of us could you some mercy now. Every single one of us could you some mercy now. Thank you, Constance. That was Mercy Now by Mary Gaucher. Our homily today will be presented by Barbara Kidney and Andrew Dalton. The topic is the road to Damascus, epiphanies. An epiphany is generally defined as a moment of sudden re revelation or insight. Both of our presenters today have seen their lives changed by new realizations that affected their spirituality and lives. Our first speaker, Andrew Dalton, was born in Truro, Nova Scotia in 1945 during World War II. His family moved a lot and eventually he ended up in Vancouver, Canada. Andrew worked mostly at university libraries doing cataloging. Then he moved to the States and pursued his interest in Rudolf Steiner. Later on in the 1970s, he moved to Germany. His many pursuits have included being a carpenter and a teacher at the Waldorf School, as well as being a school bus driver. Here is Andrew Dalton. Sure. Okay. Is it? Okay. Um, I am Andrew Dalton, and I have uh, actually three three, count them three, epiphanies I'd like to share. Uh, all in my younger years, the first one, I was in my last year of high school, what you Americans call senior year. And um, relevant to this is that my dad was a minister in the United Church of Canada. He was uh, a minister of the largest Protestant denomination in Canada, kind of middle of the road, liberal. And I was fairly active in, in the church, but when I got to about the last year of high school, I was realizing that there was sort of more to life than what this church had offered. There was more in the world of meaning and affairs. And my dad kind of realized that, and he took me to my first ever Unitarian um, church service, which was a Sunday evening. And as soon as we walked in, there was this most gorgeous classical music which I'd never heard before. I mean, I was always a fan of classical, but this was a, this was the first movement of Frank Schubert's uh, string quintet. Oh God, gorgeous. And I forget what the content of the service was, but the thing that struck me was when the minister finished his homily, the congregation could ask questions, do feedback, argue points with the minister, Wow, I've never seen this before. You know, obviously there's more to going to church than just what I've been used to. Well, it led the way to me to get involved with 
you know, fairly radical Christianity and also civil and social rights things that were going on at the time. This is like the early 60s, Martin Luther King. We certainly had heard of him in Canada. And also the um, campaign, um, CND, Campaign Against nu for Nuclear Disarmament. I became very involved with that. Well, a few years later, I'm on a big summer project on Vancouver Island. Uh, having to do with nuclear disarmament. Uh, we had a big encampment outside of a, an Air Force base, uh, Royal Canadian Air Force. And I in particular got so involved that I ended up on a two-week fast in front of the base in 1965, Comox Project. Well, one of my visitors in, in this little tent I had in front of the base was this monk. He was like a hermit, uh, a hermit who you know, just wanted to get out and be somewhat less of a hermit. And he was telling me some aspects of peace that had nothing to do with outer affairs, but inner peace. Well, I moved on from there and so did he, but we hooked up again a couple of years later because he was trying to start a group, um, a commune, I guess you'd call it. And I was um, sort of halfway in trying to see what happened. Easter 1967, Ottawa, we were gathered on Parliament Hill doing a kind of a, a ritual of our own, sort of pissing off some of the Mounties that were there guarding the Parliament. Um, and, and here comes the second epiphany. Um, we ended our affair there with a, a get-together over some homemade bread and an excellent German white wine. This is our bread and wine, the last, the, the, what do you call it, the last supper. Anyway, um, while we were having this, uh, Brother Joe, that was his name, read a lecture from Rudolf Steiner, who I never heard of before. But this was a lecture on the deep cosmic meaning of the bread and wine. Bread comes from grain. Grain is very sunlight. It's full sunshine. Uh, when it's in its last stage of brightening, it doesn't even have a connection with the earth anymore, except the stem. But there's no, you know, life going on in the stem. Just, you know, the grain ripening in the full sun. The grapes in the wine, however, are reflected light. They, the, the fruit is n never out in full sunshine. It's always covered by a parasol of grape leaves. So it's reflected light. So this is like a moon, a moon thing. The reflected light of the moon, the reflected light of ripening the grapes. And I, I just had never gone into this before. I mean, this bread and wine communion in my ch old church was just a four times a year. It was just a, a token thing. But this had deeper meaning. And I really began to think how much there was to life and, and also to uh, spiritual matters such as what I was hearing in this lecture. Well, anyway, um, I got a job after that in a, in a library where I got a chance to read a lot of Rudolf Steiner. Um, but I thought he was just in books because he died in 1925, this is years later. Um, epiphany number three, I was in England I was in the West Country. I remember um, I was at the youth hostel in Exeter and somebody whispered to me, looking at it, we were looking at a map, you should go see Tintago. Tintago, what's that? Never heard of it. It's up on the Cornish coast. Well, I went on into Cornwall, as it happens. Um, and I remember one day I was at a bus stop trying to decide, do I want to go all the way to the end of Cornwall, Land's End, like so many people did, or do I want to go up See what Tintagel is. Whatever is the first bus, well, the first bus was the one that started my journal to, journey to Tintagel. And Tintagel, uh, which is a big place I found out afterwards in the Tristan and Isolde legend, is kind of this great rock stack barely connected to the main cliffs on the north coast of Cornwall. And I was watching, walking along, looking at this thing but also looking for the youth hostel. Well, the youth hostel was, yeah, there was a sign pointing over the cliff. Do I have to jump over to get to, oh no, there it is down on a kind of a ledge of land. 
So I checked in. I thought I would, might be the only person. Because this was mid-spring. It wasn't full youth hostel season yet. And um, but the next day, beautiful, gorgeous, sunny day, I saw these two young ladies sunning themselves out on a rock. I was just outside the hostel with uh, wearing just their bikinis. Go and say hello to them. <laughs> um, lovely ladies, who are you? Oh, we are you rhythmists. What's that? Oh, um, have you heard of Rudolf Steiner? Oh, I guess I have. Uh, and that began two days of walking together with these, these ladies and hearing about the real practical movements that Steiner had started, uh, including the thing they were involved in, which was a Camp Hill. Now, the Camp Hill movement, uh, th they're mainly live-in places for handicapped children or sometimes handicapped adults. Uh, there's one up in Columbia County has been there for many years now. Well, I had to go and visit them in this place. Um, and that opened my eyes to the fact that Rudolf Steiner existed not just in books, but in actual practical movements. That's when I first heard about Waldorf, the Waldorf movement, biodynamics. Well, that was, that was a great epiphany because from then on, a lot of my life was spent in pursuit of this, that, and the other of Steiner works. Took me to Germany, and actually the thing that first took me to the United States because uh, there was a school in Detroit that was part of the movement I wanted to uh, go to. Well, anyway, those are my three epiphanies, and here I am today, thanks to them. Our next speaker, Barbara Kidney, was born in Manhattan. At the age of two, she realized she wanted to live in the country and left for Cornwall, Cornell University at age 18. She has lived in Chuanggunk for more than 20 years. She is a New York State licensed psychologist with a private practice in Montgomery, Orange County, and enjoys meaningful work helping people be more fully their authentic selves and if applicable to heal from trauma. Her social and environmental justice activity includes having been the 2020 Green Party candidate for her state assembly district and chairing Hudson Valley Green Party since 2016. She would, by the way, like a replacement. Along with her beloved spouse, Andrew Dalton, she also enjoys making and doing traditional music, song and dance and earth-friendly gathering, gardening, pardon. As a young adult, she studied and worked in agricultural science and left that field. Mm -hmm after realizing that at that time, her career would involve helping chemical companies grow health wealthy by harming public health and destroying ecosystems. Along with Andrew, she has been regularly zooming into UUCC programs since last December. As a free thinker who values the rights and lives of all members of the universe and joy, creativity and mutual kindness, she feels at home with Unitarian Universalism as her values and UU principles coincide. Uh, please note, by the way, that the background noise that you hear outside this, uh, the interview, uh, that's what was happening outside when we were recording, recording the interview. So here's Barbara Kittens. Well, I want to thank Vicki and the congregation for this opportunity. I'm basically here because I answered an ad in the newsletter. It turned out to my surprise, not too many people did. But anyway, here I am to share an experience of uh, my epiphany. And the word epiphany implies a pretty profound paradigm shift that's unexpected. So it to tell the story of an epiphany, one needs to tell the story of the old paradigm and the epiphany itself and then the new paradigm. So I'll start with the before, the old paradigm. I was born to a Roman Catholic family in Manhattan, dad Irish American, mom um, 
had been Protestant and converted to Catholicism, German and Czech. Any case, um, I grew up as a little child hearing stories for little Catholics, for example. And I remember to this day hearing those stories for the first time, very young, pre-kindergarten. And my mom was telling me stories about the pearl of great price and the idea of uh, the saying of Jesus that what does it profit anyone to gain the whole world and lose their own soul? And I knew from the get-go what that meant. I really did, and I got it, and I still get it to this day, and I treasure those ideas and sayings. But life goes on, and I was schooled in a, in a Catholic school, and there is more to the Roman Catholic Church, as most of you know, than simply the Beatitudes and those sayings and parables of Jesus that I alluded to. It's a, it's a package deal. There's more than that. And part of the package, of course, is gender apartheid and male supremacy. But, you know, I'm young and there's a lot of good stuff there too. And I'm learning and I'm thinking and I'm very religious. And as I get a little bit older, learning about science um, just makes the religion stronger for me because to learn about biology is to learn about the mind of God. This is what I'm thinking and feeling at the time, yeah, how the mind of God works. When I'm 13, the epiphany happens, and it happens at the Church of the Immaculate Conception, 14th Street, Manhattan. It's after Sunday Mass, where I go every Sunday, and I'm doing what I tend to do there, which is privately pray. And as I'm privately praying, suddenly in my head, there is this female voice talking to me. It's an adult female voice, and she is speaking with confidence and with authority, and yet she's not the least bit intimidating. And she's saying to me something like, you know, what you're looking for, you will never find here. You're in the wrong place. And she said, it's okay, I'm not offended, but you don't know because you don't know any better, so I'm here to tell you. And you can stay here as long as you like, but you'll never find what you're looking for here. It will always be a dead end. So, okay. <laughs> All right, so that's the epiphany. And I knew it was the voice of God S. And I need to tell you that this was in, I don't know, the mid 60s and had never heard of Wicca. Wicca had not come to America yet. No mother goddess, no Wicca, just the Wizard of Oz, witches and that kind of thing. Okay, so life goes on, and I start to, well, I don't start, I continue to read and think, and I'm reading literature, like the Brothers Karamazov, and I'm reading new books of the day, such as The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan, and Ruby Fruit Jungle, reading Mae Brown, and some oldies but goodies, like The Second Sex, Simone de Beauvoir. And I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, and I finally get to the point where I stop doing what I had been doing for a while, which is intellectual contortions, making pretzels and doing backflips of my intellect to make it be so that the contradictions of the Roman Catholic Church were not contradictions. Heck, they are, they are contradictions. <laughs> and, you know, I'm going with the fundamental truth. So I, you know, drift further away from the Roman Catholic Church. Fast forward to 1983. At this point, I'm living in central Pennsylvania. I'm just finishing up graduate school there. And I have recently read the then new bestseller, The Mists of Avalon by Marianne um, Zimmer Bradley, which tells the story of the Arthurian legends from the viewpoint of the female characters, most notably Morgan Le Fay, half-sister of Arthur, um, who grew up in Chintagel. But anyway, <laughs> um, so Morgan Le Fay is the um, half-sister of Arthur, but also the, the granddaughter of Vivian, the Lady of the Lake, the High Priestess, and her consort partner, Merlin. So I'm reading this story and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, if I lived in that time, I would so be a goddess worshiper. You know, I'm hungering and thirsting for that religion. Too bad it is no more, except maybe in Berkeley, but here I am in the middle of central PA. 
So one of the things I'm doing there is volunteering weekly at the Women's Resource Center. And I'm doing a shift one week and I'm hearing lovely music playing and mainly dulcimer music. So I go to the next room of the center where it is and there is Jean Gertler listening to this music on her cassette. It's 1983. <laughs> and um, so I compliment the music and we get to talking. Now Jean Gertler is a presence in town. She writes flaming, radical feminist letters to the newspaper, full of puns and wordplay. You know, she, she tells it like it is, slam dunks it. So anyway, I'm talking to Jean, and one of the things I find out is that she has gotten a master's in religious studies from Penn State. So I say to her, oh, that's, that's very cool. Are you planning to do something with that, like maybe enter the ministry? And she looks at me and she says, I'm a goddess worshiper. <laughs> so I say, why well, you're a goddess worshiper? I've been looking for those people. You know, you're, you're, you're one of them. And um, yeah, so she is, and we talk further. And one of the things she tells me is that her coven had met, met the last week and they had been full of the idea. We need to grow, we need larger numbers, more people. We need to do outreach. And Jean tells me, and I told them, we don't do outreach, they will come to us. So the next week, um, at the meeting of the Coven of the Dolphins, August 1st, 1984, I'm um, initiated, that's Lunasa. And um, to this day, you know, that's a very important thread of my metaphysical philosophy, my being, the, the thread of Wicca, and I often, tell people if they're interested that I think of myself as a non-fundamentalist Wiccan. But the words of the charge of the goddess resonate with me as do the words of the parable of Jesus that I shared earlier. There's no conflict there. But um, some of the words from the charge of the goddess are, you shall sing and dance, feast, make music and love, all in my praise. For mine is the ecstasy of the spirit, and mine also is joy on earth. For my law is love unto all beings. Let my worship be within the heart that rejoices. For behold, all acts of love and pleasure are my rituals. I speak the goddess. Thank you. Yes. My thanks to both Andrew Dalton and Barbara Kidney for their words. Now our closing words today. Oh, wait a minute. We have hymn number 1024. When the Spirit says do. Please join in singing if you can. Spirit says sing, spirit says sing. 
Our closing words are titled Because of Those Who Came Before by Barbara J. Peskin. Because of those who came before, we are, in spite of their failings, we believe. Because of and in spite of the horizons of their vision, we too dream. Let us go remembering to praise, to live in the moment, to love mightily, to bow to the mystery. Please join in saying the words uh, on the screen as we extinguish our chalices. We extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And please join me in singing the benediction song. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. Now, for those of you who are on Zoom, well, everybody's on Zoom, okay, you can join us in our breakout room.